what is one of like the most common misconceptions you hear from like producers that are just coming, you know, into the scene uh, specifically regarding, you know, their publishing or even like just the monetization uh, around publishing for them? I mean, there are a lot. The unfortunate thing is it's really easy to be artistic as a producer. And so there are a lot, and I think that's a good thing. So there are a lot of producers that are just, um, you know, starting their careers every single day. Uh, the, the issue is that a lot of us are focused more on the, on the art or focused so much on the art and we're either unaware of the business or we're reluctant to focus on the business or we're afraid to, to even, you know, jump down that rabbit hole and, and start learning about the business. And so there are just tons of misconceptions. I mean, the internet is a great place to spread lies. And I, I think some of the major ones that, that you hear all the time in the producer community is um, the first of all, that if you license beats online, you're not entitled to any royalties, which is, I mean, absolutely legally false, patently false. It's just not right. Even if you, don't know anything about the business. Even if you use a service such as beat stars, every time you license a track, there's an agreement that gets sent out to the person who's licensing that track. And in it, uh, the, the, the rights are outlined. And one of those rights is, um, the, the copyright of, of the composition. So you're retaining that, which means that if you're retaining both copyrights to your beat, when you license a track, then if either of those copyrights generate royalties, you're entitled to your, your fair share of that. Um, another one, and this is more, more a point of confusion than, than anything. A lot of producers and, and recording artists and people in general think that in the publishing world, a writer is a songwriter and a producer is something else. A producer is either considered just a publisher or just a composer. And that's also a really confusing and an incorrect idea. Uh, publishers and, and the PROs like ASCAP, BMI, so forth, they consider anybody who contributes to the creation of a song a writer. So producers are considered writers, even though we're not writing lyrics. You got to think back to before there were digital audio workstations. Who was making the music? Composers, how were they making it? They were writing it you know, on, um, on sheets, they were, they were notating it. So we're considered writers. And I think once, once producers understand that it, it becomes a lot easier because that means everybody's equal as writers. Everyone has a, as a place at the table when negotiating splits, um, you know, negotiating is, is a lot more equitable when, when you understand that, Yes, you do deserve to be a part of that conversation just as much as anybody. So, you know, you, you use BeatStars, you you put your beat out there, someone leases that beat from you, you know, in, in six months, they then release a song and they put it up on like the streaming services through like a distro kid. You know, how, how are you going about find, like realizing that song been released and then how do you go about monetizing it? It's a difficult process. Obviously, you're not going to be able to track down every single person who releases a, a song to your beat. Um, but there are these these large scale content management systems that do track at least on YouTube and, and certain other platforms whether uh, a, a song is is being uploaded and whether there are duplicates. So it's a really frustrating process, but it's also beneficial. And, and I'll tell you what I mean. Um, I upload all of my beats to YouTube, right? So. YouTube uses, and I don't know the ins and outs of content ID, but content ID is embedded in YouTube, which means that someone is, some company is monitoring all the audio being uploaded to YouTube to check to see if there's any copyright infringement. So if I upload a new Drake song, they're going to catch it right away and, and Drake's label is going to monetize my video or they're going to prevent me from uploading it. Uh, more often than not, they monetize the video so that I can't make any money off of it. And any money that's generated goes to the person who owns that recording um, and who owns the publishing, I guess, too. Uh, and so for me, when I upload my own beats to my YouTube channel, what will happen is say somebody 
licenses one of the beats that I have on my YouTube channel. They put it on Spotify or, or whatever through a, a company like CD Baby or DistroKid. So now CD Baby and DistroKid are assuming ownership, which is a, a flaw with the system. They assume that whoever is uploading that music uh, owns it 100%. So what happens to me is I get a copyright claim against my own beat because whoever uploaded it, say they uploaded it through CD Baby, now CD Baby is putting a claim on my content saying, no, we own this because our artist, our client uploaded this to their channel. And so then I have to file a dispute, which is fine. I always win my disputes. Uh, it's just an extra step. But because I'm being notified that somebody else is using my beat, now I know that someone else is using my beat. I know the, their name, I know the, the title of the song, and I can listen to it, you know, maybe they didn't license it legally, maybe my tags still in the in the track and I can contact them and say, hey, let's let's figure this out. But if they yeah. did license it correctly, then I can, if I want to, I can go register it with my PRO or I can contact them and say, hey, did you register that this? If they say yes, okay, then I need their PRO information, I need their IPI number, I need their writers and publishers information. Uh, even if they don't contact me back, I can still register my portion of the song, which is probably 50%. Um, I would just do it with song trust because it's easier than going through the PRO uh, these days. But if you're not a member of something like song trust, you can go into the BMI or the ASCAP or, or whatever your PRO is their, their panel and, and, you know, register the track. And just, if you don't have the other person's information, I believe you can just put an unknown writer, unknown publisher. In terms of like, you know, the different types of agreements that producers are working off of, you know, there's the, you know, the upfront fee, the work for hire type agreements, you know, the points on the master, uh, you know, and then actually, you know, maintaining publishing ownership, uh, you know, from your experience, which of those scenarios, you know, for more of an up and coming art uh, producer, which would you kind of point them in a the direction to kind of get them started, um, try, to, try to focus efforts on? I mean, I don't, I don't think that whether someone's new or a veteran in the game as a producer, that they should get different contracts. I, it, in my experience, when I was new and I got my first placement on, on a major record, that contract isn't much different from the contracts that I would get tomorrow from, from the same label. Um, and so it, you know, obviously it depends if you're licensing, Beats online by default, your contracts allow you to retain your master and your composition ownership, uh, which are the two copyrights that you own to your beats. With a major label, because they're not paying, you know, thirty to a hundred dollars for the license, they're they're probably paying more like five thousand to ten thousand for the for the beat. Um, there's going to be work for higher language in that contract, uh, which is to say they're going to buy out one of your copyrights, which is the copyright on the master side. So in exchange for that, yeah, you're getting a, a, a lot more money and they're uh, taking all of the royalties on the master side and then paying you a, a much smaller percentage of that, usually 3% uh, compared to a hundred. But on the composition side, the label doesn't and shouldn't touch that. So you still own, you know, your, your full 50% on, on the publishing side, unless it's an instrumental, then you own hundred percent of it. And then you can exploit that copyright. However you want, you get paid when it's played on streaming platforms, on the radio, on TV, when it's licensed and so forth. So that that's, that, I look at it like whatever is standard, given the situation, it doesn't matter if you you're new or you've been doing this for a long time, fair is fair. Yeah, it's more about the exactly the type of situation that's occurring at that time, right? Not, not so much about, you know, how tenured you are, but more so of like, yeah, is it is it more beneficial to you to take some upfront money rather than, you know, trying to get points on the master or, you know, what makes the most sense for that specific situation? And I know people are always going to ask, like, they're going to ask, you know, how do you get yourself into those types of situations, um, you know, and I know, I know the answer is just like, 
networking, doing the old fashioned stuff, right? But is there any like little quick takeaways you can tell people to try to eventually build that type of network? Yeah, and I feel like, so a lot of people will ask, well, how did you get in the position you're in? And the answer that a lot of people will give is, well, you just got to network and work hard. Well, obviously that's true. Um, but the problem is then that person might go off, meet someone and say, okay, I got to network with them. You don't have to network with everybody. You don't have to really intentionally network with anybody. You just have to be an upfront person with good work ethic and integrity. Uh, most of every opportunity I've, I've gotten recently has just been from me meeting people, having a conversation with them and eventually working with them. It, it, it's not about having this idea in your head that you have to network with this person because you're going to get something out of the situation. So I, I want people to be careful when they're given the advice to network in the music business to not take that as uh, having ulterior motives when you meet people that could help you or that you think could help you or should help you. That's not what it is. So for example, with working, um, on these recent projects with static select, I've, I've, I met him years and years ago at an I standard event in Chicago. We didn't work together until, um, I formed a relationship with, with dream life, maybe two years prior to that. And that was just me meeting him at a three C through beat stars. And then we developed a friendship. We were collaborating a lot. I introduced him to two of my friends, Stack Trace and Memory, who are instrumentalists. They started working together. Eventually, it just became this weird situation where we were all working together, but separately. So we're like, all right, let's just form a, a collective. It makes the most sense. We're, we all know each other. So that's what we did. And then once we had that synergy between the four, yeah, the four of us, then somehow it just it was the right time to start working with with static selected because dream life knew him i knew him um and he had projects that that we fit into so it it obviously that that took time that took a couple of years to happen but the fact of the matter was all of us trusted each other enough to jump into a, into a partnership because we had been working already and we we knew that we could depend on one another, you know, and that's that's a big thing. People want to rush a network. They want to rush a relationship. And it's like, I don't I don't want to network with anybody or, or I don't want to I don't want to form a relationship or a partnership or work with somebody if I don't know how they move. And the only the only way I can understand truly if a person has integrity and is consistent is by working with them slowly over time and observing how they work. Mm -hmm. You know, you Mike Trampy, I've known him for probably 12 years. And to this day, he's, he's given me opportunities because he knows that the first opportunity he ever gave me, I made it happen. The second, I made it happen. The third, I made it happen. You know what I mean? And vice versa. So that consistency over time is really what um, creates longevity from what I've seen in the music industry. And I think in any industry, in any business, in any field, yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree. It, it's, you know, I know I, I, you guys always show in your, your socials and everything how much you guys get blown up by people just being like, yo, let's work, sliding into DMs and stuff. But I can't imagine that ever that ever works, right? It's like you're not just going to start working with someone out of the blue that you've never met before just because they ask, right? Like, you need to I mean, if I'm familiar out. with them, you know, like if, nah, someone, if, if I know just... this person's dope and I've heard of them and they've heard of me and, you know, Great, let's work. But yeah, if it's a random person, I'm just going to ask, yeah, cool, what do you have in mind? And if it's just, oh, yeah, I'm just trying to work. And it's like, well, you don't know what you want. So I'm not the one reaching out to you. You should have a plan for me. So if, if you want to, if, if your idea is, hey, I want you to do this EP, then it's like, okay, cool, let's, let's make it happen. But because I don't know you and because you're approaching me and because, you know, I, I have a lot going on, this is this is how it needs to work for me to be cool with it if that works with you. If that works for you, then then let's make it happen. Otherwise, no, I'm, I'm not. I have people, you know, who th there are people out there who want unreasonable commitments. Like, hey, I want you to be my producer and I want you to be my manager. And I'm like, yo, say hi first. I don't. Number one, I don't manage. Number two, you really want me to put you on par with every other project that I have right now without me mm -hmm. even knowing who you are. So that that's that doesn't make sense. 
reputation goes a long way. Consistency goes a long way. Integrity goes a long way. If you show somebody who you are, that's a million times uh, more valuable than telling someone who you are. Yeah. And, you know, something we used to talk about on, on the Music Entrepreneurs Tour was that idea of like when you're networking, you know, you should be giving something in return of getting something, right? If you're going to ask mm-hmm. someone for something, what are you giving them in return? Right. And people, I just notice a lot, they go into these conversations of just being like, I want, I want, I want, right? Like, I want from you, but they're not offering anything up in return. So, like, why, why do they expect, you know, to, for you to drop what you're doing to help them without, you know, them offering anything of value to you? Yeah, it's weird. There's a, there's a lack of empathy out there. You know, everyone wants something. Well, hey, I want stuff too. Mm-hmm. Why not see me as a as a human with the same needs that you have? So it's weird. It's weird out here, man. You know how it is. 